We're celebrating the garden in grand style today with picnics and patriotism. All this coming up next. I'm Alan Smith. We're rolling out the welcome mat in that old-fashioned patriotic style. We're celebrating the red, white, and blue. And what I'm doing here is I'm just cleaning up some old terracotta pots. And I'm gonna give them a real festive look by painting them red, white, and blue. There are many holidays where this theme fits. Obviously, Independence Day with its festive fireworks comes to mind. And then there's Memorial Day and Veterans Day when we honor our soldiers and even Labor Day. Of course, year-round, I like to fly a flag on my front porch. A little later in the show, we'll talk to an expert who will help us understand how to hang a flag properly in our gardens. She'll also show us how she created this splendid wreath that's the perfect way to welcome home our soldiers. And I'll show you how my garden was transformed into a star-spangled show place. And we'll visit with a nationally recognized chef who shares her ideas on making the perfect picnic. And you're going to love those picnic ideas because what the chef did was take the same ingredients and show three different ways it could be presented in a picnic basket. Simple ideas, easy to create, I'll share them with you in just a little bit. But first, we'll visit a grand garden that complements the many works of art housed inside its buildings. That story up next. Today's show is called The Grand Old Garden and it's about adding a touch of patriotism into our outdoor living spaces. But this is also about gardens of grand size. This grand garden is located in Memphis, Tennessee and was once the home of Hugo and Margaret Dixon. They left the grounds and the home, including many priceless works of art, to the enjoyment and education of future generations. Today, the Dixon Gallery and Garden stands as a testimony to the philanthropy of the Dixons. Diane Reed tells us about the gardens and their history. The Dixon Gallery and Garden exists today because of the legacy and generosity of two very important people, Hugo and Margaret Dixon. In the late 1930s, they purchased 17 acres of woodlands on the outskirts of Memphis, and they built their home here and they created a beautiful 17-acre woodland garden. The tree canopy became the framework for this garden, and Mr. Dixon had a sister, Hope Crutchfield, who lived in the United States, and she was a landscape architect. The two of them corresponded over many years to create this wonderful cross-axis design. What they did is they kept the trees, and with the underneath the tree canopy, they dropped a grid, if you will, and we have major north-south axes, major east-west axes that are apparent throughout the gardens. At the end of the axes would be a focal point. In many cases, it would be a final tree that was part of the existing landscape. In other cases, Mr. Dixon would have purchased a piece of sculpture that would also become a focal point. Hugo and Hope corresponded a great deal about the type of plant material that was added under the tree canopy. They added dogwood, flowering dogwood trees that are native to the southeastern United States, many azaleas, some of which are native azaleas, viburnums, hydrangeas. Um, boxwood was the elegant evergreen that was put throughout the grounds along with many azaleas. As far as the ground level, they, all they really added was ivy, and that became the unifying ground cover within the gardens. Because Mr. Dixon was an Englishman, I always say that he had gardening in his blood, but he also created a piece of his homeland here in the United States in the Mid-South. And we get visitors who come from England and often say that this reminds them of a piece of England. I think what it is, it's really the big open spaces surrounded by the woodlands, like a country manor house, which is the feeling that you have when you visit the Dixon. Because Mrs. Dixon loved fresh cut flowers, the Memphis Garden Club began a tradition in honor of her to cut flowers from the garden and create arrangements inside the residence. And Ellen LeBlanc tells us more about this most popular part of the estate. Mrs. Dixon always had a cutting garden for the arrangements that she would have in her house and change out weekly. When the Dixon Gallery and Gardens started in 1976, we put in a new cutting garden for the arrangements that would be done in the gallery. And as the garden grew, we added a larger garden 
into our cutting garden that would be used as displays. And so anyone who comes into our galleries is able to see what they can grow at home very successfully in the Mid-South and under what conditions they grow. We always have somebody on the grounds to answer questions, to give names of flowers that are presently in bloom in the cutting garden, and perhaps give suggestions to how you might better grow your garden at home. At the Dixon, we also offer classes, educational classes, for those things that are timely in the garden and on the grounds at the time. For example, we might do an amaryllis class using bulbs that will be used around Christmas time. Right now, we would do an educational class on peonies, which are in bloom in our gardens and also will be used in our arrangements inside the gallery. But later this season, we perhaps will do flowers that grow during the hottest part of our year and we'll have another lesson at that point on what flowers bloom at the best time during that year and how to take care of it. And then in the fall, we'll follow up with our third series in our lecture of the fall blooming plants that grow in the garden, as well as the use of the greeneries that you'll be using in the arrangements inside. I love working at the Dixon because it brings my number one love of flowering plants and perennials into a very useful application because I get to grow my plants and then they can go on display inside of the gallery, but they also can be used as an educational tool for all of those in the Mid-South to understand what grows very successfully in our climates. Up next, a flag expert adds a dash of patriotism to my home and shares with us a creative wreath project, so stick around. Welcome back. Today's show is about showcasing patriotism in the garden. And what better way to do that than celebrating red, white, and blue plants? I've got some outstanding ones that are some of my favorites. Now, I've never been a huge fan of the color red because it's such a hot, intense color. But from time to time, you'll find it popping up in my designs and even in my own garden. I think red has its place. I just try to go easy with it. Scarlet Honeysuckle has a home here because it's so attractive to hummingbirds. Then there are poppies. I recall a field of mixed flowers in England and how the reds from the poppies just jumped out. Once I was in Holland and saw huge fields of red tulips. What a memory. And you'll find shades of red in a wide range of annual flowers such as amaranth, celoisia, and even cosmos. Now moving to white, my garden is filled with amazing white flowers from roses to lilies. White is truly hard to beat if you want a calm, sophisticated look. And it mixes so well with gray foliage plants like lamb's ear, dusty miller, and artemisia. Some of the white roses that I often use in my designs include iceberg, white dawn, and white American beauty. And while we're on the subject of white, let me showcase a few other white blooms I'm fond of. White daffodils and white impatience are a great way to add sparkle to a shady corner. And for big bold blooms, take a look at this hardy hibiscus. Now I've saved the best for last, at least for me, because I love the color blue. So let's talk about blue flowers. You see, blue comes in so many shades. And the plant choices, well, while they're not endless, they include scavola or fanflower, plumbago, cornflower, salvias, hydrangeas, and of course, the lily of the Nile. I like the color blue because it can make even the smallest garden seem expansive. It's like the garden is stretching out to meet the sky. There's an infinite quality to it. You know, it's always fun to decorate for special occasions and holidays. During the fall, I like to cluster mums and pumpkins on my porch, or even carve jack-o'-lanterns into all kinds of faces. And of course, the winter holidays bring out a special sparkle in the garden with luminaries, greenery, and snowmen. Who can resist? With today's show being called Grand Old Garden, I enlisted the help of my friend Carrie McCoy. Today, I'm going to show you how to make a patriotic wreath. Beautiful, perfect for the flag season. I chose the American Beauty Rose. It just seemed right. But you could pick a rose right out of your garden, or you could use a carnation. Cut your rose an inch to an inch and a half down the stem and be sure to cut it on a diagonal. I like to put the large flowers, the buds that are already opening on top on the crown and then put the smaller ones around the side. Be sure to give them enough room so that they can open up a little more and you can nestle baby's breath in there. Be sure you start with a wet oasis and when you water it down it gets very heavy. 
So go ahead and double up your wire and make your hook now before you filled it completely. Now all I need to do is add more roses and more baby's breath until I've done the whole thing. And when I get finished, it's gonna look like this. What makes it so patriotic is the bow. And if you want, you could add some flags. I love this wreath. It's elegant, it's patriotic. It's the perfect way to welcome home someone special from overseas. Up next, my garden gets a red, white, and blue makeover. And a little later, celebrate the season with one of these fantastic picnic menus. Hi, welcome back. You know, we decorate for all these holidays. Christmas, wow, do we decorate. Thanksgiving, Halloween, all of them. So why should we make patriotic holidays any different? Recently, I turned my garden over to a rather patriotic team that did a red, white, and blue makeover. I chose the Now, you met the Carrie a little earlier right. when she shared with us her wreath project. The steps can be found on my website. That's pallensmith.com. Now, let's take a look at how Carrie and her team transformed my garden. On the front of the house, they added attractive bunting and a new flag. One tip that Carrie points out is that cotton flags are more traditional, but synthetic fabrics are becoming popular because they're more weather resistant. Now, they certainly made a grand entry with my arbor and gate on the side of my house. I always say it's important to accent the entry to really say welcome to your guests. Now, for those festive Fourth of July get-togethers, it's hard to beat what Carrie did with my rondelle garden and my loggia, and it looks like a great place to picnic. Okay, now it's time for a viewer question. Today's question comes from St. Louis. Edna writes, we've noticed your American flag on your front porch. My husband thinks it should be displayed on the left column, while I think it's correct placed on the right, just as you have it. So which one of us is correct? Well, I have to say, you all are very observant. Why don't we ask an expert? The American flag always goes to the right of the state flag or to another nation's flag. If you want to, on your home, fly the American flag and fly your state's flag, you have to pretend like you are the building. So if you are the, per the building and you're looking at the street, you have to be the flag. You would be on the right, and then the other flag would be on the left. If you are standing in the street and you're looking at your home or your building, it would actually look like the American flag was on the left. Well, there you have it. Now another interesting point I learned about flag etiquette is that if you fly the flag, you really should fly it between sunrise and sunset. If you fly it at night, the flag should be properly lit. Now how about a perfect menu for any patriotic affair? We'll check in with one of our favorite chefs, Regina Charbonneau, for not just one, but three quick and delicious recipes. That's all coming up next. Okay, now let's talk about these containers. You know, I love creating a festive atmosphere, and you can do it with the most ordinary things. What I've taken here are just some basic clay pots. I've cleaned them up, I sanded them off. These were some old ones out in the garden. Once I cleaned them up, I just took a water sealer and sprayed over them and let it completely dry. Then I just chose the color of choice, used an exterior latex paint, and then applied it to the exterior. Aren't they great looking? Here we're gonna have a red, white, and blue theme. Now Regina Charbonneau has welcomed me into her kitchen time and time again, and each visit always has a culinary delight. Regina is well known for her amazing biscuits that combine her southern upbringing with her study in French culinary school. When I first asked Regina Charbonneau to come up with the perfect picnic, I knew we were gonna be in for a treat. We all look forward to this time of the year when we can get out and picnic. The problem is we all stay so busy that the idea becomes a bit overwhelming. Even as a chef, the last thing I wanna do on a day like this is stay in the kitchen. So I've come up with ideas through the years of cooking for my family and enjoying time with them, of going and buying some prepackaged items and jazzing them up a bit and coming up with simple ideas. I've come up with buying a roast chicken and prepackaged coleslaw. By doing those two simple things, you can create three different menus, a classic American, Asian, or Mediterranean. The Southern picnic is so simple. It's chicken and biscuits, and I love to find a prepackaged mango chutney that I put on the biscuits. And then I have a wonderful, easy recipe that you do in the blender for a creamy green goddess coleslaw. 
And now to the Asian inspired menu. My family loves Thai food, so I've come up with this idea of doing a Thai chicken wrap and a peanut coleslaw. The chicken wrap has the smoked chicken and lettuce and cucumber, and I put a little chili paste into a mayonnaise with lettuce and wrap it. And the coleslaw has a peanut sauce and roasted peanuts with a little rice wine vinegar. Now moving on to the last menu, the Mediterranean menu. This is such a great menu. I would serve this to dinner guests at night. You could do this on the patio or a picnic. I chose to use an Italian round bread. I did a roasted red pepper mayonnaise, the same ingredients of this roast chicken, and I added some artichoke hearts and roast peppers. And then I did a chopped salad using the cabbage and olives and capers and garden air. And open a little bottle of red wine and you're set for a nice dinner picnic. You can find Regina cooking in her kitchen at Twin Oaks in Natchez, Mississippi. For the full recipes, just visit pallensmith.com. Now I can't imagine a garden or even a picnic without some flowers. So before we close the show, I want to point out this wonderful little plant. This is a nemesia and it's a variety called Bluebird. It's a proven winner and I think it's fantastic. It'll grow in partial sun and it has a wonderful aroma. Now what's great about this plant is that while it's not completely blue, it looks good in a white container because the middle of the eye here reflects the color of the container. It makes a very striking composition. Now if you'd like more information on some great flowers for your garden, just check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. And until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers, bluebirds sing of the beauty all around. Every time the sun comes out, I can't help but smile. Oh, no, I can't help but smile.